This is Music Corona. Composers in times of crisis and adversity. I'm Robert Carl, and this is episode 10, A True Plague, Music from the Time of AIDS. We're starting off with music of John Curigliano. This is the second movement of his first symphony, which is often known as the AIDS Symphony, written in 1988, and a memorial to many of the composers, friends, and colleagues who died during the AIDS epidemic. I'm calling this episode a true plague in the sense of an unquestionable plague. AIDS was the greatest health 
crisis that America and the world has faced until the current COVID pandemic. It was, however, very different. It was far more lethal if you got it. It was basically a death sentence. And even though now it has been controlled by medication, there is still not a cure for it, not even a vaccine. And still, thousands of people do die from it every year. I believe I had read just recently that since its origins, 700,000 people have died. So you get a sense of the magnitude of the disease. HIV virus was what caused it. It was transmitted largely through sexual encounters, also from shared drug use. And as a consequence, especially because it disproportionately affected gay men, it was a disease that was easily put aside and rationalized by the majority of the country for a very long time. It was almost viewed as a form of just punishment by certain people in power. We'll come back to that in a moment. But this was something that first was a mystery. It was 1981, and young men started turning up in hospitals suddenly stricken with various diseases that were all the fruit of a depressed immune system, a vulnerability to all sorts of pneumonias and cancers that previously would not have been an issue for people in good health. And as a result, a very, very large portion of the gay population of the U.S., and that meant a very large proportion of the creative population of the U.S. was stricken, and many, many died. What we're going to listen to are pieces that are written in response to this enormous health crisis. I'm going to start off with two songs in succession that were written, one by a composer, Chris de Blasio, who actually died of AIDS, the other by the composer of music, theater, and opera, and song, Ricky Ian Gordon, who is happily still very much with us, but his work was written as a response to the death of his lover from AIDS. De Blasio's song, based on a poem by Perry Brass, is called Walt Whitman in 1989, and it takes the image of Walt Whitman, who of course cared for Union soldiers in hospital during the Civil War, coming back to New York hospitals to console AIDS patients. And Ricky and Gordon's song is called I Never Knew, and the words are also by him. And they tell the whole story by themselves. But where? 
birds have the edge of poison, and spoken bitterly. Now he takes a dying man in his arms and tells him. That takes the old man and his friend this evening. It is the river of dusk and lamentation.
Those songs, which were both written in 1992, were part of a concerted response to the crisis, which had been full-blown by that point for about a decade, manifested in a thing called the AIDS Quilt Songbook. The AIDS Quilt was an enormous, constantly growing quilt, a patchwork quilt in which people donated squares commemorating victims. It was a very powerful image of the devastation that the plague was creating. And many songs were written by composers as a kind of complement to it. You'll also notice that um, not only this music, but a lot of what we'll hear is far more tonal and lyrical than some of what one regards as 20th century modernist music. And though I am not going to wade far at all into any sort of sexual or gender-based typing, I think it is reasonable to say that there is a deep tradition of lyrical and lyrical songwriting that comes from the vein of American gay composers such as Bernstein, Barber, Copeland, and Roram, and that it is enormously influential and has been kept alive by all sorts of younger composers who believe very much in the same sort of lyrical impulse. But then moving to a very different composer, while last week almost everything that we had except for George Crumb came from the world of popular music, most of what we're listening to today comes from the work of either classical, concert, music theater composers, or experimental composers. But there's one instance of a very serious popular composer, and that's Lou Reed, who was sort of the official poet of the downtown scene for decades. He started out playing with Andy Warhol's group that was put together as a kind of band for the factory. That's the Velvet Underground. He had a song which was a kind of anthem to trans and pansexual life called Walk on the Wild Side. And in 1990, he put out an album called The New York Album, and on it is a song which is called Halloween Parade. And it is a very bittersweet song um, given in Reed's immaculate but very raw sort 
of uh, Schreck's demo. And it recounts not only watching the wildly costumed downtown characters of both the Lower East and West Sides, but also remembering so many like them who no longer were there because of the epidemic. On a personal note, I should mention that for this entire series, every piece of music that you have heard uh, came out of my personal database, my memory of relevant pieces. But this one I did not know. I was looking, doing some research, and it popped up at me, uh, and then I knew that it was right, and I'm glad that I know it now. Lou Reed, Halloween Parade. There's a downtown fair singing out proud Mary as she cruises Christopher Street. And some southern queen is acting loud and mean where the docks and the bad lands meet. This Halloween is something to be sure of. Especially to be here without you. There's a Greta Garbo and an Alfred Hitchcock and some black Jamaican stud. There's five Cinderella's and some leather drags. I almost fell into my mug. There's a Crawford Davis and a tacky Cary Grant. And some homeboys looking for trouble down here from the Bronx. But there ain't no Harry and no Virgin Mary. You won't hear those voices again. And Johnny Rio. Rotten Rita, you never see those faces again. This Halloween is something to be sure. Especially to be here without you. There's the born again losers and the lavender boozers and some crack team from Washington Heights. The boys from Avenue B, the girls from Avenue D, a Tinker Bell and Tights. This celebration. Somehow gets me down Especially when I see you're not around There's no Peter Pedantic saying things romantic In Latin, Greek, or Spick There's no Three Bananas Or Brandon Alexander dishing all their tricks It's a different feeling that I have today Especially when I know you've gone away There's a girl from Soho with a t-shirt saying I blow She's with the Jive 5, 2 plus 3 And the girl for pay dates are giving cut rates Or else doing it for free The past keeps knock, knock, knocking on my door And I don't want to hear it anymore no consolations, please, for feeling funky I gotta get my head above my knees But it makes me mad and it makes me sad And then I start to freeze In the back of my mind I was afraid it might be true In the back of my mind I was afraid that they meant you The Halloween Parade At the Halloween Parade See you next year at the Halloween Parade from here we go to something else very much from New York's downtown, far more experimental, and that is work by the poly-talented Diamanda Galas. One could call her the Callas, and I mean Maria Callas, of the avant-garde. 
She is a soprano with an extraordinary instrument that she is unafraid to push to unbelievable lengths. But she's also very much a performance artist and composer. And she, throughout the 80s, created works that were direct response to what she regarded as not only the horror of AIDS, but also the horror of the treatment of AIDS victims. And it was compounded by the fact that her brother, who was a close collaborator, died of AIDS in 1986. The piece you're going to hear, and it's an extended excerpt, it's about 11 minutes long, is called The Law of the Plague. It consists almost entirely of quotations from the Bible about the way that victims of plague are supposed to be treated. At the very end, there is a text of Galas's own, which takes on essentially the voice of a fundamentalist preacher or a politician such as Jesse Helms, who was one of the leaders of persecution of gay people. Though it's also a text that points the finger directly at such folk as the true devil. This is intense stuff. It's rough stuff, no doubt about it, but it's absolutely astonishing in terms of the power and virtuosity and embedded terror of it. Law of the Plague, Diamanda Galas, this is 1990.
few pieces project a greater sense of overwhelming anger and terror as this. We will now go to something where similar feelings are presented in perhaps a more refined manner, but still one with enormous power because of the full resources of the symphony orchestra. And this is our return to the Corleano Symphony No. 1. This is the first movement. I'm going to play the whole thing, which is, again, about 10 minutes long. And it is subtitled Of Rage and Remembrance. We just heard pure, unadulterated rage from Diamanda Galas. Here we hear a different sort, but just as real rage. And as the title suggests, there's a deep desire to try to honor the memory of those who have fallen. The piece has one particularly extraordinary moment where out of the wings you hear a piano playing softly, and it's the Albanet's tango, a piece that one of the composer's dear friends deeply loved. And so we have a memory emerging out of the chaos of rage to project a moment of tenderness before we move back. I should mention that the movement that we heard at the beginning is, in fact, a tarantella. It is a kind of scherzo for the piece. And since the tarantella was a dance to escape the poison of the tarantula, this movement is a grim death march to memorialize the victims.
as we near the end of this podcast, it seems important to point out one other major work that deals not only with AIDS, but also with the whole world of gay culture, and that is the appropriately titled Gay Life from 2001 by David Del Tredici. Del Tredici is a composer who started out as a brilliant young serialist who forsook it in order to write the music that he felt he really had to write, which was far more neo-romantic, but with what I would call an almost hallucinatory tinge. It's embodied in his settings that are many pieces in a series of portions of Alice in Wonderland. Final Alice was a work that truly established his reputation, and just after that he won the Pulitzer Prize for another work in the series, In Memory of a Summer's Day. But Del Tredici also has been a militantly gay composer, He's seen it as essential, not only to his self-image, but to the very nature of his music. And this fearlessness presented itself in this six-movement cantata for amplified baritone and orchestra, again called Gay Life. It is a work of quite extraordinary vision and proportion and it's almost something that seems as though it has been suppressed. Uh, it's not been taken up by orchestras. It's not been commercially recorded. And one can only think that perhaps even with the enormous shifts that we've had in social attitudes over the last couple of decades, it still may be a little bit too hot to handle especially for orchestras, which are amongst the most conservative arts organizations. Whatever the case, and I want to emphasize that I'm about to play you something that was given to me by the composer himself, and I'm hoping he will not object my playing an excerpt from it. If he does, he can let me know and I'll take it out. But this is the penultimate song of the series. It's called Here. It's on a poem by Paul Monet. It is the monologue of a man who is dying of AIDS, who is watching his own life evaporate, and who is dealing with the feelings of anguish and conflict in his relationship with his lover, who will be the survivor. In fact, the two voices in the poem start to emerge and be in a sort of synchrony. This is here, David Del Tredici. Still how 
And so we come to our grand finale, and in a way it really is, because this comes from the world of music theater, and it has a real upbeat feel to it, which perhaps is good after all the sadness we have gone through in the last hour or so. This is from Rent by Jonathan Larson, 1996. This musical was a portrait of the world of the Lower East Side of struggling, poverty-stricken artists, all of them marginalized, many of them LGBTQ+, and its composer, Jonathan Larson, was in fact a straight white cis man but he was enormously empathic and he was obviously observing very, very closely and intensely the world and the community around it and trying to record it. He did that in this musical, which of course has a truly tragic backstory in that the day before the preview performances began, he died of a very rare heart condition, which at the same time ensured the legend of the piece. Fortunately, it deserves its reputation, not just based on that fact. And what I'm going to play you right now is the showstopper La Vie Bohème. This is a paean to the world of 
artists, intellectuals, freaks, and outsiders, all of them trying to find a world and a voice and a community for themselves. It happens in a restaurant where in response to a group of what appear to be Wall Street brokers who are kind of horrified by them, the family, I guess we could call it, decides to make a tribute to everything that they believe in and to assert their values. There is a checklist of things that were current at the time, and many of them still so. Everything from yoga to Kurosawa. And it's somehow music that takes what could be a really dirty, one might even say degraded lifestyle and celebrates it to such a degree that it is now a staple of the high school musical scene. No mean feat. It is, incidentally, a rewrite of Puccini's La Boheme, placed into New York of the 80s, a little bit the way that Romeo and Juliet was transposed by Bernstein and Sondheim into the West Side before Lincoln Center was there. This is from the film version of the musical. There are a few moments where plot points of various characters are advanced, which interrupts the flow of the number a little bit. There's also one, in my opinion, rather lame joke about the Puccini source, but put that all aside. This has enormous energy and, yes, compassion about it, and speaks to the world that was going to emerge from the ashes of the 80s. So, La Vie Boheme, Jonathan Larson, Rent, 1996. Dearly beloved, we gather here to say our goodbye. On these nights when we celebrate the birth In that little town of Bethlehem We raise our glass You bet your ass to La Vibo La vie bohème La vie bohème La vie bohème days of inspiration Playing hooky Making something out of nothing The need to express To communicate To going against the grain Going insane Going mad To love attention No pension To more than one dimension To starving for attention Hating convention Hating prevention Not to mention of course Hating dear old mom and dad To riding your bike Midday past the three suits To fruits To no absolutes To absolute To choice To the village voice To any passing fad To being an us for once Instead of a damn La Vivo Mister, she's my sister. 
so that's five meat, so soup, four seaweed salad, three soy burger, dinner, two tofu, dark platter, and one pasta with meatless balls. Ew. It tastes the same. If you close your eyes. And 13 orders of fries. Is that it here? Wine and beer! To have crafted beers made in local breweries. To yo, that's to yo, to rice and beef and cheese. To love and to dill, those to curry with lalu. To wear a ranchero, semaya and jalu. Emotion, devotion, to causing a commotion. Creation, vacation, mucho masturbation. From passion to passion to when it's new to sun time, to sun high, to anything taboo. Ginsburg, Dylan, Cunningham, and Cage, Lenny Bruce, Langston Hughes, to Buddha, 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 Sisters? We're close. Brothers! Bisexuals, trisexuals, homo sapiens, carcinogens, hallucinogens, men, kiwi hermit, German, white turpentine, Gertrudstein, Antonioni, Bertolucci, Kurosawa, Carmina, Barana, to apathy, to entropy, to empathy, ecstasy, Vox Mahalo, the sex pistols, eight beasts. To marijuana, to sodomy, it's between God and me. To SNL, waiter, waiter, La Viva L. In honor of the death of Bohemia, an impromptu salon will commence immediately following dinner. Maureen Johnson, just back from her spectacular one night engagement at the 11th Street Lot, will perform Native American tribal chants backwards through her vocoder while accompanying herself on the electric cello, which she ain't never studied. And Mark Cohen will preview his new documentary about his inability to hold an erection on the high holy days. And Mimi Marquez, clad only in bubble wrap, will perform her famous lawn chair handcuff dance to the sounds of ice tea being stirred. And Roger will attempt to write a bittersweet evocative song. That doesn't remind us of Musetta's waltz. Angel Dumatinard will model the latest fall fashions from Paris while accompanying herself on a tin gal and plastic pickle tub. And Collins will recount his exploits as anarchists, including the tale of its successful reprogramming of the MIT retro reality equipment to self-destruct as it broadcasts the word Actual Reality at the Fridays! Excuse me, did I do something wrong?
And that brings us to the end of this episode and almost to the end of this series. We end in the final years of the 20th century. Next week, I'll return with an epilogue looking at what we might have learned from this now that we face our own special crisis. On a concluding positive note, it's worth remembering that from the first diagnosis of AIDS in 1981, unbelievable change has occurred. It's really only 40 years, but same-sex marriage is now the law of the land. While the AIDS activist Larry Kramer, the founder of ACT UP, has just died, he passed away as an icon, and ironically, one of his best friends, after having been enemies early on in the fight for accelerated medication, was none other than Dr. Anthony Fauci. So things can change, things can turn around, and in this case, the enormous concerted response of an afflicted community actually brought about enormous social change and progress. I'll leave you on that happier note. See you one more time soon.